India is one of the world's largest producers of salt, and a third of it comes from deep in this desert. The dry, cracked land of Little Ran of Kutch was once a seabed. Today, over 6,000 families live in this desert, farming salt by hand. They're known as the Agariyas, and they've been salt producers in this harsh environment for generations. The air can reach up to 118 degrees Fahrenheit. And the land they work on is so salty. All to earn just $4 a ton. That same salt will sell for $260 a ton as table salt, soap, or detergent. The Agarias have faced a long history of mistreatment. But that stigma continues, and this is why, you know, the salt farmers still continue uh, to do this job. There have been government efforts to change things in recent years, but many still live in poverty. We went to India to learn how the Agariyas became trapped in the big business of salt. Thousands of years ago, this area was part of the Arabian Sea. Apna jo Shaurashtra aur Kutch do island the. लेकिन जो चेंजेस आया काफी साल पहले उसमें सौराष्ट्र का प्लेट ऐसे डाउन हुआ और कच्छ का ऐसे डाउन हुआ तो बीच वाला पार्ट एक हो गया और वो डेजर्ट बन गया इट वाज स्टिल वाटर लॉक दो एज पार्ट ऑफ द इंडस रिवर डेल्टा बट एन अर्थक्वेक इन 1819 चेंज द डायरेक्शन ऑफ द रिवर एंड देयरफॉर दिस एंटायर एरिया गॉट ड्राइड अप बट द वाटर दैट स्टिल सिट्स अंडरनीथ द मड इज 10 टाइम्स मोर सेलिन देन सी वाटर making it a perfect place to farm salt. It was considered as a commodity which is equivalent to uh, gold. And the Agariyas have been working here ever since. Monsoons fill this area with water starting in June. It can take another four months for the waters to recede. That is when the salt farmers come into the picture. Bhavna Harchandani is a research scholar who lived with the salt farmers for seven months. The Agariyas arrive every year in October. Patadia Gugabai and his wife carry everything they'll need to live in the desert for the next six months, including supplies to make their huts, clothes, farming tools, and all their food and water. First, they have to find the key to this whole operation, salty brine water underground. They dig 30 feet into the mud to get to it. Digging wells can take up to a week. The families then set up these government-subsidized solar panels, They'll power the pumps that bring brine water to the surface. Then the Agariyas build the salt pans, these expansive salt flats. The roller helps them flatten out the earth. They'll make 10 to 20 pans, all by hand. It's back-breaking work. Now, working in the desert is not a joke. Everyone in the family pitches in to help. Then the farmers will release the salty brine water from the wells. It flows between the pans. By the last pan, the water reaches the 24% salinity needed to form big salt crystals. The farmers are so skilled that they know it's the perfect salinity simply by tasting the water. So, this is a square hair, which is minimum 300 to 400 salt. 
Over the next few months, as the water evaporates, salt crystals form. This rake costs $22, too expensive for many of the farmers. They have to rake the salt crystals every day for the first three months. They start raking early each morning to avoid the hottest part of the day. But working here can be really dangerous. The life expectancy of a farmer is about 60 years, because not only do they face extreme temperatures, they are dealing with subsoil brine which is highly acidic. And you also, and exposure to that subsoil brine also comes with a lot of uh, problems in, in skin. Many of the Agariyas become blind from years of the bright sun reflecting off the white landscape. And because they're so far from the nearest village, accessing medical care is often too expensive. Despite these conditions, the Agariyas live and work out here until spring, when the salt is finally ready. They harvest three times. The first produces the best quality salt. They leave in April, usually with over a thousand tons of salt, and they'll sell it to a trader like Rafiq Rahimbai. His team picks up the harvest with trucks. Once it arrives from the Ran, Rafiq employs 200 workers at his factory in Tikar, processing and packaging salt. He says he loses about 20% of the salt during the washing and draining process. It gets packaged and sold as edible powder salt and as crystal salt to be made into soap, detergent, and baking soda. This whole process refines the salt and makes it more valuable. So Rafiq can sell his product for upwards of 60 times what the farmers make. Bhavna says in the time she lived there, she saw salt traders working together to pay as little as possible. If I'm a farmer, if I go and argue that this price is too low, I need more. He will say, okay, don't give me your produce, go to someone else. And then that man, the trader will go and tell the other trader, if this man comes to you, don't take his produce. Rafiq denied taking part in such practices and says farmers can negotiate their prices. <laughs> Rafiq says he pays the farmers above average, between five and eight dollars a ton, but Insider could not confirm that. And most farmers we spoke to said that this season's market price for salt is between two and four dollars per ton. <laughs> That means in a good year, a family will earn just over $4,000 for six months of grueling work. But this doesn't pay for all the expenses they have as they prepare for the next harvest. So at the start of each season, many Agariyas have to come back to traders like Rafiq and ask for a loan to help them get through it. However, that taking advance has now 
made them fall into the vicious trap of loans and debts. This is the reason why they are unable to come out. That means in a good year, a family will earn about $2,000 for months of grueling work. That's well below the poverty line. The Agarias have never really had control over the salt they farm. The British classified the group under the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871, basically branding all members as criminals from birth. But many historians say it was really a way to control tribes that were poor, low caste, or didn't support colonial rule. The law gave police the power to monitor the Agarias' movements and arrest them with little cause. The British also owned this land. So even though the farmers were still allowed to work here, the British would take the salt to England, process it, and sell it back to Indians with a heavy tax. The salt farmers, they were not supposed to take their salt out from the region. So what the women used to do, they used to hide the salt crystals in their, in their petticoat, and then they would take it out because salt was expensive. Many Indians couldn't afford the taxed salt, even though it was a staple in their diet. If you cut off the salt supply, it's like, you know, you are raging a war. It got so bad that in 1930, Mahatma Gandhi organized one of his most successful acts of civil disobedience, a 240-mile salt march. As he moved from town to town, it seemed that all of India was behind him. 60,000 protesters were jailed, including Gandhi himself. Salt would be contested until India's independence in 1947. After British rule, the Agarias were denotified, meaning they were no longer classified as a criminal tribe. But that stigma continues. With few other options, they were trapped, producing salt. This is why, you know, the salt farmers still continue uh, to do this job. And they're still working on land they don't own. After the British left, the little Ron of Kutch was taken over by the government, which leased it to the Agarias. However, the government has stopped renewing their lease. And in 1972, most of the area became a protected wildlife sanctuary. Therefore, they are illegally producing salt. They are considered as illegal. But the government has an unspoken agreement with the community allowing them to keep farming around the protected areas. The government even provides equipment, like the subsidized solar panels and boots to help protect against foot infections. In the long term, the salt farmers and their advocates hope for more government involvement, starting with setting a minimum price for salt. Ecologist Ajay fears that might backfire. Salt farm बढ़ने के कारण ecology पे ये असर हो रहा है कि पूरा जो groundwater है वो भी धीरे-धीरे कम होता जा रहा है. अगर ऐसे ही रहा और ऐसे ही instrument से लोग salt बनाते हैं और अगर salt farm ज़्यादा बढ़ रहे हैं तो ये भी हो सकता है कि आज से 20 साल के बाद शायद ground में पानी नहीं रहेगा तो यहाँ पे शायद salt भी नहीं बनेगा. As their own farming depletes the brine, the Agarias are moving deeper into the desert, further away from established towns and villages. Probably we can at least provide them with minimum water facilities so that, you know, at least they have some amenities. But until help arrives, these people will be back next season.